Roads? Well, we're going, we don't need roads. No. I am your father. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. You're listening to After the Ending, the only film podcast where we tell you what happens after the ending of your favorite films. And now, here are your hosts, Mike Spring and Phil Edwards. Hello and welcome to After the Ending. I'm Mike Spring. And I'm Phil Edwards. And Phil, tonight we are doing things a little bit differently. We're trying out a a slightly new format again, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to tell people how we're gonna how we're gonna do it tonight? Yeah, well, the past few uh, well, since we came back and we went live on video, you know, three D, <laughs> uh, we've been doing a main feature where we do the after the ending and uh, we discuss various things. Then we would stop, and then we do another uh, episode, the post credits one, where we do a top five, and then have our recommendations. But this time we're going to be decided to mm, throw them all together in a great big monster mash. And just have one big episode where we do all all the things all at once. Well, not all at once, consecutively. <laughs> that would be confusing. Uh, that's what we're going to do now because that way, if people who are watching from the beginning on the first episode commenting, they don't have to stop as we set up a new one and just just carry yeah. on. And it just, just it, it saves time, makes it a more streamlined thing. Right. But that's it's all new to us really. Still doing the video, so we thought we'll see what happens and see how this one goes doing it this yeah. way. So if you're watching live, not too much will change. We'll be on a little bit longer. We'll still be here every other week. If you're watching the afterward video or listening to the podcast, um, you'll have an episode every two weeks instead of every week, but the episodes will be twice as long. Um, so if you still want one every week, you can just listen to the first half if you want, <laughs> I guess, and then come back a week later and pick up. Or you can just listen to the whole episode. It'll be double-sized. Basically, we're kind of going back to our original format in a way. Yep, um, yep. Where it's the, the hour-long episodes, you know, with the after the ending and then some of the other stuff. I mean, slightly different in terms of what we're talking about, but you're still going to get our after the ending and our top five list in every episode. And I think that's kind of always been the, the gist of what we've been doing. So hopefully it'll work out well and you guys will enjoy it. So if you're watching live, as always, please feel free to make comments we will be happy to read them on the screen or on the show and react to them and and tell you what we think about what your comment says we think your comment stinks no i'm just kidding (laughs) um but uh we love to hear from viewers live so uh tell your friends you know grab the family gather around the fire turn up the radio turn up you know on grandma's hearth and uh you know uh put the family dog outside i don't know but gather around get the words get yeah, join yeah. the conversation. Yeah, yeah, we love to have comments. So, uh, Phil, t- since this is our jam-packed, double-sized episode, our first one, uh, why don't you tell people what we're going to be talking about tonight? Okay, well, listener, viewer, this is what we're doing today, tonight, or whenever you're watching or listening to this. Right. We're going to be going after the ending of Logan's Run. That's the film from 1976, based on a book starring Michael York, and it's all science fiction and things like that. Then we're going to be discussing... Dune, because there's a little film called Dune in the cinemas at the minute, Denis Villeneuve's uh, adaptation of Frank Herbert's classic sci-fi book. So we're going to be discussing... Spoiler free. All, <laughs> yeah, all, all, the, all the, the books, games, things, comics, That's there's been lots of things about Dune. And also, just before we started, Legendary gave uh, released the news that Dune Part 2 is going ahead. So if you've been waiting to hear about the news before you went to see the new film, you can now go see it knowing there will be an ending. Yeah, basically uh, yeah, so that's we're talking about be... everything Dune except for the new movie because yeah, I don't know if you've yeah. seen it yet, but I haven't. But it's a little early. We don't do any spoilers. So we're going to talk about kind of everything Dune up until the new movie. So if you haven't seen it yet, don't worry. We won't be we won't be spoiling anything. Yeah, spoiler free on on the new Dune. Although yeah. you read the book, you know. It. But anyway, yeah. So that's what we're going to be doing after the ending. Logan's run. Talking about Dune. Our top five is going to be our top five favorite Bond movies because Daniel Craig's last Bond film came out uh, recently. And then we'll be doing our after the ending recommendations where we talk about things that we like at the minute. Not necessarily film related, could be anything, can be films, but can be other stuff as well. Yeah. This is actually this is a I think this is an exciting episode. We got we got, you know, Logan's Run, a sci-fi cult classic. We got Dune, which is as big as it comes. We got James Bond. I mean, that's a lot of good stuff in one episode. Who knows what else we'll talk about? We like that's our tangents. We've been all known to go off and talk about other things from time to time. That's true. That's true. We do like a tangent. Yes, yes, we do. Absolutely. That could be on a t-shirt also. Yes, but first of all, before that, though, Mike, 
Do you want to tell people about your Kickstarter, which you've got going on at the minute? I would be happy to, yes. So uh, let me put up the URL actually for it. So yes, thank you for, for that nice, lovely segue, Phil. So I am, uh, as many of you, if you've listened to the podcast, you know I write stories all the time. I write these movie sequels, as does Phil, but I also write comic books. Uh, this is the first two issues of my comic, uh, Red, White, and Broke. And um, actually, let me uh, do the thing with the screen that we discovered we could do last episode, right, right yeah. Phil? There we uh, go. This is my comic, Red, White, and Broke. It's about a superhero who can't pay his bills because every time he flies off to save the world, he gets fired, which is what would happen in the real world. So... He goes on national television, reveals his identity to the world, and starts a Kickstarter campaign to fund his superheroic. So kind of a superhero comedy. It's a lot of fun. Right now, I have a Kickstarter running for issues three and four and or the complete miniseries. This is going to wrap up the first storyline, so you can pledge on all four issues. You can pledge on issues three and four, pledge on issue one, however you want to do it. They're all there. You can do it right at this link here on the screen, tinyurl.com slash rwbmini. We'll take you right to the Kickstarter, or you can just go to Kickstarter, search for my name, Mike Spring, search for Red, White, and Broke. You'll find it. Um, and please feel free to pledge. If you like what we do on the podcast, I can almost guarantee you'll like what we do uh, with the comic. So uh, please check it out, and any support is greatly, greatly appreciated. And there you go. That's my little my little uh, pitch there. Excellent. I will add a link to that as well, to the Kickstarter, and when it goes on the podcast and on all those places as well. I'll get that added. So you'll be able Appreciate to find it. that. Awesome. So that's that's okay. All right. Well, let's jump in then to uh, talking about Logan's run, shall we? Yes, let's do it. All right. So Logan's run. Well, let's start off with uh, just a little bit of, uh, you know, chit chat. Phil, how do you feel about Logan's run? It's one of those ones. It's 1976. It's a, uh... It's an old, it's it kind of looks a bit dated now, but it doesn't in some ways. Like you just said, it's an old, like you know, like yeah, we're just calling it an old, you know, yeah. it's an old, an old like film, it's it yeah, almost as old as me. One I'm of those olds, old. I don't trust yes. those, olds. but it's uh, it's got a good cast. I always enjoyed it. It's uh, although my first memory of Logan's Run was the TV show, which was mm -hmm. a spin off from this, right? But I've never read the book, I always liked the film, uh, I like the concept. And I like the the way it goes. It's a bit cheesy. The, I mean, every now and again as well, they keep talking about doing a a remake or a new adaptation. Mm -hmm. but they mm -hmm. uh, they've still not done it, and it still keeps going in development hell. I think for a while Ryan Gosling was attached. So right. I know how you feel about Ryan Gosling sometimes, Mike. Doing his uh, <laughs> I like his Ryan Gosling. Yeah, He's one big. I, well, I always, I always know your your reaction to Ryan Gosling in Drive, where he doesn't actually say much. Oh, well, yeah. Drive, yeah, that's a different yeah. story. That's that's yeah. a movie that has so many problems I can't even begin. But, um, yeah, <laughs> I just people don't say nothing in situations like he is in. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, we have a comment though. Look at this, James. James Powell says, "I love Logan's Run." James has good taste. I do too, James. Um, actually, it's um, I agree with you, Phil. Right? I mean, here's the thing about Logan's Run for me is it is dated for sure. Like so many '70s sci-fi movies, you know, there are parts of it you look at it and you're like, wow, that's a little, it's a little cheesy here and there. But I do really like it. I remember I didn't see it until I was an adult. Maybe that's part of what I liked about it. So I, I was able to watch it and sort of say, yeah, this is kind of cheesy, but also um, there's parts of it that really hold up. I think when they first get out to the surface. Uh, some of the special effects and the visuals is is you know are really cool, um, but I do think it's ripe for a remake. I think it's one of those movies that's perfect for a remake because people like the original, but it's not so well loved that people are going to go, "No, how can you remake Logan's Run? It's perfect because it's not. It's kind of dated and kind of cheesy." And I think it could be a really fantastic with a modern budget and modern special yeah, yeah. effects. I don't know why it can't seem to get off the ground. Uh, James has now lost all respect that I had for him a minute ago by saying he loves Logan Run, by saying that Drive is one of his favorite movies. <sighs> but he doesn't say anything. It just, it's, you don't that's, just. That's how you know he's a, he's sit a in he's someone's a kitchen for like 10 minutes while she talks to you and just stare at the walls and not respond to her. That is not how people act in real life. It is, oh, it's so frustrating. I want to do the rest of the episode like Ryan Gosling and Drive. <laughs> And I, you know, and the other movies that I've seen since then by Nicholas Winding Refn have not done anything to reinforce. Like, Drive is basically like, oh, I accidentally made a movie that's kind of okay, as opposed to all my other terrible movies. As opposed to, oh, I make great movies, and Drive is just not not as good as the rest of them. No, sorry, no, just not. I don't hate Drive; it's okay, but I wish he talked. It's really bothersome when you watch it and you're like, why isn't he saying anything in any of these scenes? Normal people talk. Anyway, we're not talking about Drive. We're talking about Logan's Run. 
And that's what it'd be like if Ryan Gosling from Drive was on this episode. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what it'd be like. Yeah. Except, except the silence would last for about thirty-seven more minutes. Yeah. Although I really like Drive. It's also got a good soundtrack, but it's a good film. Yeah. And that's why it works. The synergy, because you know, we we have opinions, and we don't hate each other. And also, there's a big ocean in the way, so you know, <laughs> we can't come to blows. <laughs> yeah. So what are we talking about? Oh, Logan's Run? Yeah, yeah, Logan's Run. We both like Logan's Run, basically. Yes. Is what. It's yes. taken us uh, 10 minutes and 31 seconds to come to the conclusion that we both like Drive. So, I mean, no, we don't even <laughs> both. <laughs> yes, we, we both like it. We both like Logan's Run. Uh, James Powell, now I agree with you again. Nicholas Winding <laughs> Refn is overrated. James, you're putting me on like a roller coaster of emotions right now, man. I can't deal with it. I agree. He's completely overrated. Um, totally overrated. Okay. All right. Let's get back to Logan's run. Let's do Logan's run after the ending, shall we? Let me give yes. the setup for it. Uh, I think you mentioned 1976. It's a science fiction film starring Michael York and Jenny Agutter and Richard Jordan. Uh, and Farrah Fawcett's in there, too. Um, but here's the story. It's 2274. Humanity lives underground in a utopia. Except the only problem is everyone has to voluntarily die when they turn 30, so this utopia doesn't burn through their limited resources. Enter Logan 5, who is a Sandman who hunts down people who try to run when they turn 30 because they want to live. He's forced undercover by the computer that runs the utopia to find a sanctuary, a rumored place where utopia is real and people can live long lives. Logan and this girl Jessica 6 go in search of sanctuary. They end up on the ruined surface of the planet. They discover a robot that brings food down from the surface to the underground. And that food includes other escaped runners, by the way, mm. meaning there is no sanctuary. It's all a lie. But they defeat the robot. They go out into the world, into the ruins of Washington, D.C. They meet an old man, which is proof that they can live as long as they want to. They end up getting captured again. And then when they reveal to the computer that there is no sanctuary, it overloads its circuits and it frees all the locks on the underground and humanity comes to the surface, meets the old man and realizes that they too can live much longer than 30. And that is Logan's run. Well done. That's everything. Yes. Thanks. Um, and let's see before we get started. So James says, Richard Jordan as Francis is excellent in Logan's run. Love that guy. Absolutely. Richard Jordan, definitely a good actor, but he is great in, in Logan's run for sure. And it's also, he connects us with June, David Lynch's June, because he plays Duncan Idaho. In That's June. right. That's mm -hmm. right. Yes, he's quite good in that as well, actually. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. So let's get into our endings then. Phil, do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? Uh, I'm happy going first. All right. Yeah. Okay. So the citizens of the city feel lost. With the city systems down, their basic needs are not met and panic begins. However, Logan, Jessica and the old man manage to calm things down. The city does still provide shelter and sustenance for the moment, although at some point they will have to start finding their own food out in the wilderness. Logan realizes they'll need to plan ahead and plan what happens next. They have freedom, but nobody quite knows what to do. That's the trouble when people are being molly coddling you but that's that's the way it is people are excited though the fact they can live longer especially the one whose gems have gone red but people do come forward and volunteer and end up finding their niche in organizing things logan finds he's good at scouting and explores the area outside the city he loves finding new things he finds old technology books and the, with the help of the old man he learns to read some of these texts which help immeasurably and he marvels at the creatures that live outside. Once again, the old man helps by naming them for Logan. Deer, squirrels, rabbits, cats, dogs, and more. One day, uh, Logan sees a flash of white and realizes it's a rabbit, which darts away. Logan chases after it because he hasn't seen anything like that before. As he follows, he ends up stumbling and falls and tumbles down a large hole. He hits the ground hard, but picks himself up and dusts himself down as he looks around the cave. The rabbit has gone, no sign, but a tall, bald man stands there wearing mirrored sunglasses. Mr. Logan, says the man, I don't have much time, but you must listen. Reality is not what you think it is. You're being lied to. What, what are you talking about, asks Logan? I simply offer you a choice, says the man. <laughs> and holds out his hand. In one, one hand is a red pill, the other holds a blue pill. Do you want to see how far the rabbit hole goes? That's my after the ending. 
<laughs> that's awesome. Uh, I love it. L like a literal rabbit hole too. I mean, that's the that's the best part about it. I like it. It's okay. on the nose, but it's just the right amount of on the nose. You know what Thank I mean? You. Very well done. Very well done. All right. <laughs> well, there may be some sort of uh, tie-ins in mine as well, but oh, not, okay. not that particular one. Um, okay. Well, very nice job, Phil. I like it. Mm -hmm. I like it. Let's uh, let's go ahead. I'll tell you what I've come up with. Let me um, let me see if I can change. It's hard to manage this whole changing the modes thing and all that while you're in <laughs> in the show. But I'm still here. here. Here we go. It's been one year since the freedom of humanity. Logan and Jessica have been made the leaders of the new society. Some people in the underground didn't want to leave, so two societies formed and they barter with each other. The above grounders send down food like vegetables from their new farms and harvested wild game, but no people this time, of course. While the below grounders people, the below grounders send technology up when needed, such as robots for repairs and construction. The surface world is still in a shambles, but it's slowly improving all the time. Small settlements of humans have landed in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia, other major hubs in the Northeast. One day, a stranger named Herbert George wanders into Washington, D.C. He spends a few days in the city interacting with the people and hearing about the differences between the above grounders and the below grounders. And when he's wandering around, he hears a man saying, you know what those below need? More locks on the city gates. Keep them locked below. Hmm, Herbert thinks to himself, below more locks. Interesting. After another day or two, he climbs back into his hidden time machine and travels back into 1895. I've got what I need, he thinks to himself. There'll be two races, the Eloy underground and the Morlocks above ground. It's perfect. Doesn't take long for Herbert George H.G. Wells to finish his novel, The Time Machine, which goes on to become a massive hit worldwide. He pats his trusty time machine and says, where to next, old friend? Meanwhile, back in the future, group of people gather around a ruined library they're throwing books on the fire they can't read them one of them looks at one doesn't know what it says it's the time machine by hg wells he looks at the picture on the cover throws it in the fire and keeps himself warm for another night and that is the end oh i can't hear you now what happened can you hear me now yeah there, there you go okay that was very good. Though. I like that. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I thought maybe you were doing your uh, drive impression again. No, yeah. no. That was something. My, my commute for some reason. Technical difficulties. Uh, uh, yeah. Very good. I like that. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I got. I thought, you know, I like the idea of tying in HG Wells and the above ground. Once I started with the above ground and below ground thing, I couldn't get I couldn't get rid of it. So I thought it would be fun to have a little time. I did at some point also think about having, you know, Doc Brown show up, but, you know. His kids were named Jules and Vern. I was like, I can't crisscross the the pre twentieth century authors. You know, don't cross the streams. It just seemed a little too chaotic. So, <laughs> oh, excellent! No, I liked it. All right. Well, there you go. So those are our endings for Logan's Run. It's a fun science fiction film. It's definitely it definitely dated is its biggest problem if you watch it now. But I do think there are actually some. It's kind of like watching the Planet of the Apes movies. Some of the later ones, like the special effects are dated, yeah. but they're still cool visuals. And I think when Logan goes up into the ruined world, there's some really neat moments to me where he travels to the city, and they did a really nice job of um, visualizing all these ruined cities, kind of like in. Um, it's the Will Smith movie, the last, um, you know, the Omega Man, the other version. Oh, yeah, yeah. Call, yeah, it, the, oh. <laughs> call the Wild, whatever oh, it's called. I can't what it is. You know what I'm talking about. The yeah, Last Man Standing, like, something. I can't I think of it like. now, of course. But, um, I'm Legend. But, uh, you know, they do a really nice job. Is it? What? I am Legend. What book. Okay. Oh, I am legend. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, same type of thing. Uh, lesser budget, but like some really nice matte paintings and stuff that kind of visualize this sort of ruined world. You know, um, and, and that's you know, I think that's uh, I think it's definitely worth watching. You know, and Rich, <laughs> one of our listeners, our viewers, just chipped in with I am legend. Also, he got it. So thank you, Richard. Appreciate that. Uh, also, Richard says nice tie-ins both. Thank you very much. I wondered about Cocoon. What happens when Logan and the rest get to a certain age? Interesting. Mm. That's good, interesting. Man. Yeah, you could tie that in too. I it's funny. I thought about Cocoon as one of the movies we were talking about tonight. We were thinking of something science fiction-y. Um, but they have a Cocoon 2, and I didn't feel like going to do like a Cocoon 3. So interesting that that came up on tonight's show. So mm. thanks for sharing, Richard. Appreciate your thoughts. All right. So that'll wrap up our section on Logan's Run. But it is a good movie. If you haven't watched it, definitely check it out. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, okay. 
So next up, it is time to talk about everything Dune. Dune, Dune, Dune. <laughs> you see what I did there? <laughs> I did. That was, that was very good as well. Thank you. Just, uh, uh, I couldn't resist. Yeah, so before we go any uh, further, I have I have seen the new Dune movie. but Oh, you have? Um, I wasn't sure if you had or not. Yeah. Yeah, I have uh, not. All I, will say, all I will say, it's very, very good, and it's worth seeing on a big screen with a really good sound system. I am going to see it tomorrow night, actually. Um, I have HBO Max, so I could have watched already, but and I, I'm not really opposed. I have a nice big screen TV. I'll watch most movies at home and be pretty fu- pretty fine with it. But this uh, this is one that I think definitely I really wanted to see on the big screen. Um, I don't love Denny Villeneuve's movies usually, but I do think he's an extremely um, talented visual director. So and I I'm yeah. not sure how I'm going to feel about this movie. So I figure if I end up not liking it, at least I want to be able to appreciate the beautiful visuals on the biggest screen possible. Cause just from the trailers, it does look like it's at least at the very least, it looks like it's completely gorgeous. Um, and I don't want to miss out on, on seeing that and getting the kind of the scope and the scale of it. Um, yeah. So I'm going to yeah, see it tomorrow. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely worth a uh, trip to the cinema. Cool. 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 Um, okay. So we're going to just try to talk really like, like, like I said, this is sort of our history with Dune. Like where do we fall in the Dune fandom scale? What have we experienced and not experienced in the past with Dune? Um, just kind of thought, you know, since a lot of people are talking about it, talking about the new movie, I know there's been a lot of mixed reactions, everything from, oh my gosh, it's brilliant. It's the next great science fiction epic to what the bleep did I just watch? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen all kinds of reactions. Um, and I think that's understandable because uh, what I've experienced with Dune, I have found to be um, a little polarizing at times. So certain things I've loved, certain things not so much. So I feel like there's definitely room for, I can understand where people might come from on that. So we thought we kind of, you know, go back and revisit some of the previous Dune, um, you know, tie-ins, projects, novel, the, the source material, everything, and sort of just sort of, you know, share how we feel about it. So Phil, what do you think? What's your, what's your Dune fan level at? What do you, uh, what's your history? Tell me, tell me about something Dune related. Okay. Well, I've, I know what there's a whole doing? series of books by Frank Herbert. The first one was 1965, called Dune, which is what this this film and David Lynch's film were based on. Uh, that's the only book I've read in the series, to be honest. But I really, really enjoyed it. It uh, goes a lot more in depth than all the films and things things do. But it's it has you know it deals with sets up the the world building's amazing, characters are great, good action scenes and things. And then uh, David Lynch's 1984 film. I, I saw I, I really like it. I, I love it. It's just I'm a big fan of David Lynch anyway. I just think it's I always enjoy it. I can see the faults in it, but I just like the fact that it's this crazy he goes all in on the weirdness because he's David Lynch, but he really does it. And it's it's also, I mean, compared to the new one, it's also probably a little bit easier for a viewer to maybe comprehend, even though it's still confusing, because David Lynch's Dune is full of exposition and you get to hear the people's interior monologue and thoughts. And things are explained that way. Uh, although the new Denny Villeneuve's one, you do still you can ease, you can follow it and things like that. But it's I like the fact it's it's a dense, intelligent science fiction fantasy kind of story. But it doesn't it's you know it's a bit more serious than things. It's not it's it's one where you can just you can just sink into and you can go well. What's the meaning of this? What's the meaning of that? What's why are they doing this? And it's just one which makes you think about things and you, you keep thinking about it after you've finished watching it. Just before we started, I'd been, I was taking a break from doing what I was doing today and I put on uh, David Lynch's Dune. Dune. I've not seen it for a long time. And uh, I was I just got sucked back into it again. I mean, I, I, once again, especially because it's been a few years until I saw it, you can see the faults, of them, but you can also go, wow, these sets are really cool and it's that's disgusting. Oh, that's cool. I really like it. It was also Kyle McClacken's debut, feature film debut, and I've always been a big fan of his. But it's, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of Dune. And there's been, oh, video games as well. I love the Dune video games. And we had to, a bit like Command and Conquer, you had to build all the things and then get your move things out the way when the sandworms came up and stuff like that. And there's board games, which I've still not played yet, but which my friends have got. But there's, it's, it's a science fiction thing, which is just covers many different things different different that many different mediums and as, mm-hmm. then there's the tv shows but we'll go into that but uh what are your thoughts how do you feel about you i have a complicated relationship with dune i think um i um i've never read the book i have the same problem with dune i have with lord of the rings which is i've wanted to read it for a really long time and then every time i pick it up and i flip through it i'm like ah oh, so many words 
such small print like it, and, and then i flip and i see all these words that i don't understand because you know sieges and, and yeah and, and b'nai jesuits and all these things and like it's i get it because i've seen i know what they are but like there's just yeah, so yeah. much of that it's so daunting that i'm just like oh maybe later i, I think i'm gonna die never having read dune or lord of the rings um but i want to i have a strange fascination with dune even though i've never really liked anything dune related all that much with one exception i'll mention but it's funny when you mentioned the david lynch film um, I saw it years ago and didn't really like it that much, but um, they put out Arrow Video, who does some really amazing collector's editions. If you're a fan of Dune, you have to get their collector's edition that just came out. It's like a box set. Um, it's, it's a two disc Blu-ray set. It's got like a 60 page book, tons of extra features. It's beautiful. The, the box art is amazing. It's absolutely gorgeous. And so I got that to review. And I was like, all right, I'm all in. I'm going to watch Dune again before the new one. I watched the original again. And I'm going to really give it a shot this time. Because, you know, last time I just sort of watched it. I was like, I've never seen Dune. You know, whatever. And yeah, yeah. this time I'm like, I'm going to sit there. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to absorb it. I'm going to, you know. And I watched it. And, um, I just, wow, I just really don't like it. Uh, it is a hard film to watch. I don't like David Lynch's body horror stuff. I find it a little too grotesque for my, t my tastes. Um there was so much unnecessary grossness in that movie, for one. I also think that hearing people's thoughts is a huge misstep. I understand mm -hmm. he was trying to fill in this huge amount of exposition, but I think it's awkward and clunky and kind of cheesy. Um, it makes it hard to take it seriously when every character is, you know, staring at somebody and it's like, you just hear them going, but what is she thinking? But what if this happens? This yeah. in this weird whispery tone. There's lots of people, bits where people raise an eyebrow. Yeah, right. I, I just it. I, I tried really hard to like it. I really, I really wanted to like it this time around, and I, I, I think I liked it less. Um, so that's disappointing. <laughs> um, <laughs> the only thing of Dune that I've really ever truly enjoyed so far was the Sci-Fi Channel miniseries adaptation of it back in like the 2000, early 2000s. I don't want to say it was almost like it was 2000 itself. It was a six hour miniseries, a three episode miniseries that adapted Dune. And I really liked it. I thought it had the right tone where it was like, it was serious, you know, but it wasn't like grim, dark, serious. You know what I mean? It was more like serious, but with like a peppy kind of energy to it. And with the six hour running time, I think it really... Um, had time to breathe and explain things, but it also broke the, the book up into three sections and it, where it, it sort of like, because there are very different chunks of the book, right? There's sort of the setup yeah, yeah, yeah. and then there's the whole Paul in the desert and all that stuff. So it really kind of like the first episode was all the in the, in the, not the castle, but like whatever you call it, the castle. Then the second episode was like more out in the desert. And the third was like the big war stuff. Like, so it just really, really worked. And I liked it. I liked the kid they got to play Paul Atreides. It had a good cast. Um, they need was, this one, to it. was this the one with William Hurt? Like yes, yes, that. that was the one. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was two two thousand. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed it. They did a sequel to it, which I don't remember enjoying quite as much. I think it was Children of Dune, but that was the one thing of Dune I've really enjoyed. They did. A, they launched a comic book series last year, which was like a prequel to Dune. Um, and I try. I started reading that, and I had a hard time following it, and it, it looked gorgeous but I just couldn't get into it. And I, I stopped reading that after the first four or five issues. Um, and I know they have the whole Kevin Herbert uh, or Kevin Anderson with Frank Herbert's son doing a whole series of new Dune novels. And I really love Kevin Anderson. He's a writer I like a lot. So I've thought about reading those, but I just, I picked those up and read the descriptions. I'm like, ah, they still sound really dry. I don't, <laughs> but then every time something new of Dune comes around, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, a new Dune thing. I want to try it. I buy the comic book. You know, I read, there was a graphic novel adaptation that also came out last year, separate from the prequel. And I read that and I was like, ah, it's still a little on the boring side. Like I really wanted to like that. And I didn't, and I rewatched David Lynch's film and I didn't really like that. So I'm like, I don't, I, but every time something new of Dune, I'm like, I'm so excited to watch this or, or read this. And then I'm never, I never lives up to what I want it to be. Yeah, uh, and I don't know what this new movie is going to be like. I have I have my suspicions about how I'm going to feel about it, but I don't know for sure. Um, part of that being because of Denis Villeneuve as a director, um, who I think makes really beautiful films that aren't really that good for the most part, except for Arrival, which I love. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's complicated with Dune. It's one of those. Yeah. I really want to love this world of Dune. I want to get into it, and I it seems like they're working really hard to keep me out of it. Well, it's nice that you keep you keep trying. You keep trying yeah. to, get, to get into it, but the uh, the the TV uh, mini series, yeah, I I saw that that was good. It was Alec Newman as Paul Trades, but I think that was good as well because, as you said, it was like six hours, 
spread over three episodes. So it gave yep. things a chance to to live and breathe. And also the exposition was spread out a bit more. And that's one of maybe one of the things you might like with uh, the new film is because it's it's about two and a half hours, I think. Mm-hmm. But it's it only covers about half of what David Lynch's Dune covered. Right. Even, even though this new film's longer than David Lynch's one. So it's it's sped sped out and it just it flew by as well for me, although there was a bit a few a few bits as always which just seem to drag a little bit but it's uh maybe that's what it is maybe it's just having the time to just explain things works a lot better yeah yeah because it is it's a big dense heavy book full of full of things i mean i did i love the new film and it does cover things very well but there even then even though i know dune and things i've read the book even then there was every now and again i was going what was that what right and sort of really had to think about it yeah We've got some we've got some opinions, some comments uh, to share from people. Uh, James says new movie is awesome. So there's another thumbs up for that. It's a good Mm -hmm. James. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I hope I will, too. I really I I want to love something Dune. I really do. I promise. Um, Like I said, the miniseries is the one thing that I've I've really, really liked so far. Uh, And then Richard um, says, love the computer game, just like you, Phil. I've never played it. Can't comment on that. Wasn't a fan of Lynch's film. Agreed. Uh, Visually stunning, but a topsy turvy interpretation. I agree wholeheartedly. I love sci-fi, but I'm not sure if I'll watch Villeneuve's film as I tend to, as I find he tends to flirt with crawling up his own butt a little too much. I have never described him that way, but I think I may have to start Richard because I agree. Uh, He makes these beautiful films that are very self-important and very full of grandeur, but don't actually say much. My biggest complaint with, Blade Runner 2049 is what was the point of the movie? And I don't even mean from like, like, oh, they made it because, you know, they wanted to make money. I mean, what was the point of the story? Like the story ends and you're almost exactly right where you were at the beginning. Like there was no point to any of the things happening in the film. Nothing happened for any reason. Like we didn't get anywhere by the end of the movie. Like nothing changed in anyone's lives. So it was like, what was the point of it all? And that's that that is kind of how I see his movies. So that's what that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, fair enough. But if you're if listeners or viewers, we did do an after the ending of the original Blade Runner back in episode 20, if you want to go that's back. Right, that's that. right, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, Clearly, I, I knew could have taken a few lessons from our endings. If yeah, we, we, a better we draw, I mean, it's always there. People want to contact us. We'll be happy you know, to discuss prices if you want to right. use any of our endings. But yeah. I did ask on the Liffa Films Twitter page, uh, uh-huh. uh, I asked, what did you think of the new Dune movie? And it was oh, yeah. the options were good, average, bad, and David Lynch did it better. Okay. And um, so far, the good is it 71.8%. So it All seems right. to be, it seems to be people, people are really digging it. I will say on my social feeds, I saw a lot of people commenting on it and I saw way more people saying they loved it than I saw the WTF comments. Although there were a few of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've seen that as well. Know, people for sure. Yeah. Um, but I definitely saw a lot of people saying that they really, really enjoyed it as well. So I'm glad, like I said, I want nothing more than to go to the theaters tomorrow and be blown away by it and just absolutely love it. That would make me so happy. Um, because like I said, I really, I love the idea and the look of Dune. And like I said, I got this box set from Arrow Video and I was like drooling over it because it's a, such a, a pretty thing. I read the yeah, whole book it about it and I just, I really really like the idea of it. I just want something of Dune to just blow me away so I can really just say yes I'm a Dune fan, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm so glad, though, Dune Part 2 has been given the go-ahead because I think if we never got the Part 2... Yeah, two, I, I think, agree. I think, I think that would have made the enjoyment of this first film just sink down a bit because you go, oh, no. Yeah, I agree in, in that I even well, if I don't good. like the film, I don't like to see things kind of like that go unfinished. Um, I hope I do enjoy it, but if not, even then, I want the people who did enjoy it to get the second half of the film. And I also... Um, uh, I think um, I also, you know, hopefully they'll be able to, uh, to you know, to do more of them and lead to a series of great films. Uh, we're both laughing for those listening after the yeah, fact. Yeah. James says Facebook needs to add speech to text as I am driving and I have a lot to say, but I only get to type it every red light. LOL. Yeah. Sorry about that, James. Drive we're not safely, to... drive safely, James. Yeah, drive safely for sure. But um, we're, you know, feel free to when you do get to a place you can catch up, you can just spew a bunch of comments, and we'll try and fit them in. <laughs> so sorry about that. But listen, we're glad that you like us enough to listen while you're driving. Appreciate that. That's, yeah, that's yeah. nice. Um, oh, Richard Brown as well says Chris Nolan and sci-fi. I have to agree because if regular listeners will know that, I feel like I feel the same way about Christopher Nolan as you do about Denny Villeneuve. Where it's sort of like, gosh, I I get that, movie? I get that to an extent, but I think his movies have more. 
I think I know you, you know, you've got your complaints. I think they have more of a point and more of a story to them than mm -hmm. I think Nolan focuses more on story than Villeneuve does personally. Plus Christopher Nolan never made enemy. And frankly, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that means he automatically wins because <laughs> enemy, if for those of you who don't know, is one of Villeneuve's first films and it's one of the weirdest movies. And the ending is one of the most mind boggling things i've ever seen and it just makes you literally want to just scream what the bleep at your television out it's loud so, which is, i'm so pretty obvious. sure what yeah, i did so obvious i'd explain it but you know it's there's no point everybody gets it yeah it's so obvious some dude made like a 45 minute youtube video deconstructing how to how to understand enemy if i have to watch a 45 minute and i've had people tell me just watch that i'm like if i have to watch a 45 minute video to understand your movie you made your movie wrong it's as simple as that mm -hmm. just saying anyway um <laughs> All right, good. Any other thoughts on Dune, Phil? Uh, I'd like to... Well, I'm looking forward to trying on the board games because they reskinned well, an old board game which was out from a few years ago. But there's been lots of other ones as well, like card games and uh, deck building games, which have all been getting really good reviews. And it's mm -hmm. all really diving into it. And it's it's nice to have something even... I mean, some people don't like it, but some people love it. But it's nice for people who do like it, enjoy it, to have all these things to dive into and really just yeah. basically wallow in it. And it's nice to have a thoughtful, well-made science fiction film out there as well, where it's just, it's 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 nice to have a reason to go to the cinema. It's always good to go see a film there. And it's, even if you end up not liking it, it's still, as you said, it's going to be, it's a visual treat. Although in, my one complaint with the new film is that in, in some places, it's mainly when people are talking, it's a bit dull. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's these cool visuals, but then there's bits when the people are in, building and the talking and it's just all like gray concrete or brown stuff behind them and it's just i just every now and again it could have done with just a tiny bit of, pop of color something just a little just something else it's just it's only a little bit and it didn't put me off but that's my one of my few complaints about yeah. the film but i did love the new film i have heard it's a very beige movie um yeah but... it's understandable yeah but it's yeah. uh yeah, so what you're saying is that occasionally a denny villeneuve film is dull hmm what a surprise <laughs> <laughs> but, but on the whole, visually, there are some just incredible scenes and composition right. and the sense of scale you get as well with the ships and the sandworms. Is, is right. That's good. Yeah, that's what I want to see. And really good performances. Everybody was on, on the top of the game. Right. I know it's in the desert. Well, we got another comment from Jay. Jay says it's in the desert, Mike. I know it's in the desert. That doesn't mean the whole film has to be beige, though. There are mm -hmm. other colors you can put in the desert. I know. I know. Oh, it's, I, I, it's I also wish it had been a little bit more where you get the feel of the people living their daily lives and things sort of not, not so much just because it, it sometimes you just felt like it was just Duke Leto and his family living off on Caladan mm -hmm. um, a few people on June it's so good it's a huge epic scale but it, on, on occasion it just felt a bit small with only a few people a handful of people and if, every now and again you get like lots of soldiers but all faceless soldiers but that's that's just a few complaints, but it didn't uh, didn't take me out of the film or anything. I think I felt like Lynch's film did the same thing too, though. It's kind of like it's like pretty much just the Atreides family and the castle, and then yes, the, yeah, it's the at least at least no David Lynch's film had little dogs and things like that. Right, Rob, right. yeah. holding a pug and stuff yeah. like that. Right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I think that'll wrap up our discussion of Dune, um, because. I don't know, unless you have anything else to say. I think we've covered it pretty well. we still got a top five list and our recommendations to get to. Yeah, so, yeah. But if, if you've seen um, June, let us know what you think. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Share your thoughts. Yeah, but that's, right. that's June. So let's do this then. It is time to switch over to our top five James Bond films. Dun, dun, dun. That's going to be not an easy list to put together. See, I made that like a musical intro. It was amazing, yeah. It Thank be, you. I've been working yeah. on it for days. Um, yeah, yeah, top five amazing. James Bond films. So obviously we wanted to do this. Um, uh, well, hang on. We got one more comment from Jay about if you didn't know about the history, you'd be very disappointed of how it ended. Um, but I think you're talking about Dune, I assume, Jay. Yeah, the news uh, film, then, yeah. Right. And then James finally got a chance to catch up. So he says, to catch up, love the Dune video game on the old Amiga. I actually love the Lynch Dune. Uh, even though it says lunch, Dune, but I know what you mean. Don't worry. Uh, hell, Brad Dourif, Richard Jordan, Jurgen Proc now, Patrick Stewart, great cast, agreed. Yeah. I love the style and the cinematography by Freddie Francis. Yeah, I, it's a great looking film. I, I won't argue that. I just don't like it because it's gross and it's I just doesn't, I don't know. The story feels like it's 
So all this build up, and then it's like, oh yeah, we need to have them all fight for the future of the planet with the sandworms. We'll throw that in the last twenty minutes. It just didn't, uh, it just didn't work for me. Yeah, David Lynch's film it does suddenly pick up speed. Yeah, and then yeah, sort of go because it takes its right. time, takes its time. Dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Right. Uh, and McMillan as the Baron is better than Skarsgård, and I love Stellan. Uh, well, yeah, I, I like, I like them both in there as Baron Harkin. Oh, that was the other thing. Yeah, it's Harkonnen. It's Harkonnen and the David Lynch thing, but the new film, they keep going, the Harkonnens. And I kept going, what? Harkonnen, Harkonnen. <laughs> no, me too, because, yeah, it's Harkonnen. Everyone knows that. Yeah, Harkonnen. Harkonnen. <laughs> Have you Harkonnen. It must deal with the Harkonnens. And they're going, what? Say it properly. Mm. But anyway. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. uh, and then Jay says that that list would be very hard to do. It was Jay. It was very hard. I'm still not fully satisfied with my with my list, but um, you know. Anyway, uh, one more comment, and we'll move on from Doom. But Richard, I have to agree. Uh, he says that uh, Richard Jordan is great. Hunt for October when he says I'm a politician, which means I'm a cheat and a liar. Um, absolutely, I, he's fantastic in that movie. I agree. Everything about Humber October is great, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, Rich, no, just Richard Jordan fans, if you like that, he was in a film which isn't that great, but I quite like uh, called uh, Raise the Titanic. And way back in episode yeah. 87, we went after the ending of that, so you can go back and listen to that and see what happened once they ro rose the type, raise the Titanic. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Don't show James's list yet. Let's do ours. No, I'm not going to show James's. James has a, that's his top five, but we'll see. Um, we will. Uh, we'll come back to that after we share our. Just top be careful five. driving, James. Yeah, I, well, it sounds like he's gotten a, a chance to stop. So, all right. So, no time to die was in theaters. Uh, still in theaters. It's been a big hit so far. It's Daniel Craig's swan song as James Bond. Um, as you guys probably know, if you've listened to the show for a while, I am personally a huge James Bond fan. Um, I have been for my whole life. I really love the Daniel Craig um, movies. I loved No Time to Die. I thought it was utterly fantastic. Um, and so we thought in honor of that, we would do our top five James Bond films. Uh, and then I started doing the list and I instantly regretted uh, suggesting that we do a top five James Bond flick list for yeah. two reasons. One, I enjoy so many of them. It's hard to quantify which ones I like better than others. And then for two, like half the films I've seen very recently and half the films I haven't seen in like 10 years. So then it's like recency bias comes into play and it's like, which one was this one again? Do I like that one? Which part of it do I like? Is it, do I like it more than this? I can't, you know, here's a movie I saw a month ago. Here's a movie I saw 10 years ago. Which one do I like better? It's hard not to be like, well, I, I watched this one recently and I really liked it. So it was a tough list for me. How about for you, Phil? Yeah, it was tricky. And like you, I think if, depending on which ones I'd seen recently, probably would have changed things. And on a different day, could be a different list. But uh, it did bring back lots of nice memories because lots of the James Bond films, it's uh, reminded me of being a kid and watching them on a weekend or Bank Holiday Monday with my grandparents or my parents and just sitting watching it and just the real stupid, especially the Roger Moore stuff, the stupid things there. But it was just, as a kid, it's just loads of fun. And that's the thing about James Bond. I always liked the fun element of it and the fact is you know there's some action there's some crazy bad guy some you're not sure well you do know he's going to save the day but i just like the journey getting there and mm -hmm. and james bond being james bond yeah 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 i'm with you um a couple comments <laughs> james says he's in bad traffic that's why he can comment so oh, good, okay. luck. good luck james uh, but he also said that uh, richard jordan died shortly after hunt for october and we lost a great actor. That is true. It's funny when we just talked about him and listed all the great movies he was in, the great roles he had. It's like he's not one of those people that you automatically think of when you think of great actors that you love. But then you're like, boy, he was great in so many things, you know. Yeah. He's um, one of those actors, whenever you see him, you know he's going to be great. And yeah, he adds like, value to anything. Yeah. You know, he's and he could just, whenever actor. he's on screen, you're just always drawn to him as well. He had that, yeah. uh, he had that something. All right. So top five James Bond films. You went yeah. first on the ending, so I suppose I should go first on the uh, Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, this could change next week, by the way. If I went through and rewatched every James Bond film, I bet you I'd have a completely different list. But this is what it is as it stands right now. So at number five is Dr. No, the original 1962, the very first film that introduced the world to James Bond with Sean Connery. Here's my problem when it comes to Sean Connery. And here's why I picked Dr. No. I love Sean Connery as James Bond. I don't love all of his movies. I feel like he was the best James Bond who made kind of the not the worst James Bond movies, but like... There are some of his movies that I really don't love. Um, there, you know, things like I'm, I don't think I'll spoil anything because I hope it didn't make your list, but like You Only Live Twice is to me one of the worst James Bond movies. Um, yeah. uh, right. You know, there's other ones that I, I like Goldfinger a lot. There's other ones I like, but Dr. No, I kind of felt like it was sort of the classic, like it's got some iconic scenes. It, it is a really, it's not quite the, 
the iconic James Bond yet, but it's it's laying the groundwork for it. Um, and so uh, that is my number five is Dr. No, the first Sean Connery, first James Bond film. I feel like I had to make it on the list. Yeah, a good choice, a good choice. Uh, didn't make my list, but a good choice. My sure. number five is, uh, is a Pierce Brosnan one. It's Tomorrow Never Dies from 1997, mm-hmm. which I just quite liked. I liked the whole thing, the fact the bad guy was, uh, was like a media mogul. Who just had control of the news, and because he could control the news, he basically controlled everything. Mm-hmm. I like that. I always like Pierce Brosnan as a James Bond as well. He's very suave, sophisticated, a little bit of uh, danger to him, but also had Michelle Yeoh in it as uh, who I just thought was brilliant. She was a proper Bond girl as because she was just kicking ass, taking names, and just mm-hmm. an equal to Bond. I loved I love the bits when they were both breaking into somewhere and you're just looking at each other when he just. You know, Bond was a little bit out of his depth at first because he couldn't, because he realized, you know, he was a, she was an equal to him and there was the respect. I just like that whole dynamic and but just the bad guy was good. The whole plan as well. It was just, uh, yeah, I really liked it and some, some good moments and, and gadgets and things, but uh, that's my number five. Very good choice. I do like Tomorrow Never Dies quite a bit. Didn't make my list um, because there's a lot of James Bond films to pick from, but it was certainly, um, I I did think about it um, because I do like that one. All right. My number four, um, which was hard for me to put at number four. I feel like it should have been higher, but I wanted to spread things around a little bit. So my number four is Casino Royale. That is the first Daniel Craig movie. Um, I really, really like the Daniel Craig movies. Um, I really like them a lot. To me, I think they're sort of the culmination of the Bond experience just because as technology has gotten better and filmmaking has gotten you know more advanced and stuff, I think they really do a lot of things right. I love Casino Royale. I think the, the story is good. I think the action sequences are great. I like this relationship he develops with this Vesper Lind character. And I really like how they decided to make the last five James Bond movies with Daniel Craig um, sort of an ongoing storyline. I mean, they're mostly standalone movies. You can watch one from beginning to end and understand it, but they all have this sort of connective tissue to them that culminated in the last one. And it all started in Casino Royale. And it's like, you didn't even realize when you're watching it that they were setting up the groundwork for so many plot threads that would continue on into the further movies. Um, but they did, and but they did it in a way where it doesn't detract from it because you're like, oh, this is just set up. It's like its own perfectly encapsulated little movie that also happens to set things up for the next four films. Um, and I, I really like it. I just think it's, I think Daniel Craig is perfect as James Bond. I think the tone is right. Um, I, the action sequences are terrific. It's, it's got an emotional heft to it that I really liked. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's my number four. Again, I feel like it should be higher because I like it so much. But uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Fair enough. <laughs> Okay, my number four is Live and Let Die from 1973. It was the first Roger Moore Bond one, and it was the first James Bond film which I ever saw. Which one did you say it was? Which one? Uh, Live and Let Die. Live and Let Die, thank you. So it's probably why it's on my list, uh, but it just I always quite liked it as well because it was just, it goes from a few, uh, some of the areas it covers as well, Harlem, uh, New York, Caribbean islands, things like that. And also I loved, I always liked the uh, Paul McCartney theme song for it. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of the best. On theme songs, but I, I just like it. But as I say, it's probably mainly because it was my first experience with the James Bond movie. Sure, that's fair though. That's fair. Um, I have a theory. I would, I would like Baron, Baron Sunday as well. The, uh, the <laughs> yeah. I have a theory about James Bonds, and I'll get into it in a minute. But I have a comment from James. I want to. He disagrees with you a little bit on Tomorrow Never Dies. Uh, it says Tomorrow Never Dies is one of the worst villains and henchmen. Dreadful. Also one of the worst movies for product placement. I so, can't believe you said that. I'm just going to finish my Perrier water. I'm just, uh, <laughs> Wait for your next film, Mike. No, I, I understand. I understand because it's you could say this about all the Bond films as all well. people love some of them, hate some of them, or go, eh. but it's uh, that's the good thing about Bond. There's uh, there's always going to be one that you like at some point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So my number three is also a Roger Moore film, which ties into my theory about James Bonds, which I'll tell you before I tell you what the movie is. So I have a theory in a way that I I don't know if I believe is 100% true, but that for a long time, my theory was that your favorite James Bond is whoever your first James Bond is, right? So people Mm -hmm. who are older than me tend to um, all love Sean Connery and say he's the best James Bond. I grew up with the Roger Moore films, so I don't think he's the best James Bond, but he's certainly one of my favorites. I love the Roger Moore movies. You know, I, I could have put 
two or three of them on this list. You know what I mean? Because that's the Bond I grew up with. And I think the younger people, younger than us, will love the Pierce Brosnan and James Bond. It'll be his favorite. And then, you know, younger, younger people, will. it'll be Daniel Craig, right? Um, so while I don't at this point consider Roger Moore my favorite James Bond, he is certainly one of my top and I enjoy a lot of his movies. So my number three, though, is The Spy Who Loved Me, um, which I... You know, I don't know if it gets a lot, a lot of love. It's not as well revered as like For Your Eyes Only or Live and Let Die, I think. I think Spy Who Loved Me, maybe because it's a little bit, has some silly moments. It does have like the car that turns into a submarine and stuff like that. But I think what I liked about it is it kind of gets into like slightly wacky territory, slightly science fictiony territory without going full on science fictiony, like yeah. Moonraker yeah. or anything like that. And it's just got a lot of great action set pieces. It's one of the biggest James Bond movies, I feel like, you know, before the more modern era. Like it's the one that's got the whole underwater base that rises is up like the legion of doom superhero you know headquarters and stuff like i just as a kid i just thought it was such a great cool fun movie and even watching it as an adult i still find it really really enjoyable and it's i think one of um roger moore's kind of it was him hitting his peak i think in my opinion no it wasn't his first outing necessarily where maybe he was still fitting into the role though i think he was pretty from the beginning it wasn't the later ones where he's starting to show his age a bit this one is like kind of like right in that roger moore sweet spot so um so yeah i really like it uh, Spy Who Loved Me from 1973, I believe. That's my number three. Excellent. Yeah, good one. Uh, I've not seen that in a long, long time, but I know it, it is a good one. Yep. I have, to be honest, I enjoy most Bond films when I, when I sit down and watch them. Uh, my number three is, it's another Pierce Brosnan film, which uh, surprised me that I had two on the list. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's uh, 1995. It was his first one, Goldeneye, which I, I quite liked as well. Uh, I, I love the fact it was like we had another double O agent with him, Sean Bean's. Mm -hmm. I've always liked it when you got a bit more of a you saw a bit more it wasn't just always James Bond you saw a bit more of the people supporting him and things like that I did I did like that and I liked uh, I liked the setup to it I like some of the great set pieces the, the the opening scene with the the dam was fantastic uh, I was also a big fan of the Golden Eye video game on the N64 and uh, oh, my everybody friend, was. My friend was hated playing it with me because I just always used proximity mines and just yeah, anyway, I was good at it at the time. Right. <laughs> but yeah, Golden Eye, I just, uh, I liked, uh, a big fan of Pierce Brosnan as it. I like the the plot. Uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, the, the hacker. He was a bit over the top. Yeah. Alan Cummings thing, but apart from Alan Cummings, even though I'd still quite like him, but uh, I did like it. it was Judy Dench, Shazam. It was nice seeing. That was, was that her first one as um I think it was but uh yeah a yeah. good cast some good stories some good set pieces and it just it'll work really well but that's my number three Cold great number. choice great choice um we do have a couple of comments from from richard and james um that we'll get to sharing in a little bit but i will um share james's and i'm going to hold on richard's for right now about his five worst james bonds we'll get to that after, but James said that Bonds always jump on the flavor of the week. Live and Let Die equals black exploitation. Moonraker equals Star Wars. Quantum of Solace equals Born series. I'm still waiting for the Muppet Show inspired Bond. Uh, yes, that is. Yeah, yeah. It is true and not true at the same. I mean, it's true in that they do, but it's not like every James Bond film. It's more like once a decade or so. They're like, yeah, hey, yeah. this thing's really popular. Let's try and do it that way and see what, what happens. And then they usually it doesn't work that well. And they're like, let's just go back to doing James Bond. And that's when they get back to being good. But I agree with you on all three of those. Um, that's why Live and Let Die didn't make my list. Cause I thought about that one versus Spy Who Loved Me. Cause I do like Live or Let Die, but it does have some of that kind of black exploitation kind of feel to it that I feel does, does take away from it a little bit. Um, you know, like it's trying too hard a, a bit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My number two is actually your number three. Uh, it is 1995's GoldenEye. Um, like you said, Pierce Brosnan's first. Um, I love that movie. I, it is a near perfect Bond movie in my opinion. Um, I think it's great. They have, the, you know, they did the nice thing where you get Pierce Brosnan in his tuxedo for an extended period of time. And then also in like his work clothes, you know, um, yeah. I, I always thought he was a terrific, terrific James Bond. Um, I love the scene with the pen clicking the pen in a uh, golden oh, yeah, eye yeah, yeah. Uh, is so tense. Um, the whole ending set piece of that giant like satellite dish thing, you know, in the, like the jungles, it's yeah, so yeah. massive. It's such a big scale. And the fact they were able to film on it, like it's, it's so impressive. I, I just, everything about that film works for me again. I think, like you said, you know, the cast is great, you know, with Sean Bean and JD Dench, Pierce Brosnan is, is perfect as James Bond. It's a shame he only lasted for only well, lasted. He only got to do four movies. Um, but uh, yeah, Goldeneye, I think, is is really the James Bond at nearest peak uh, for sure. So that's my number two, Goldeneye. Good stuff, good stuff. 
Okay, my number two is uh, Sean Connery won it. Uh, Goldfinger from 1964, mm -hmm. which was uh, the third James Bond film. Uh, it's the, sort of the one when you think of, many people think of this one when they think of James Bond because it's got the it has the Aston Martin, it's got the Pussy Galore, it's got odd jobs, it's got the henchmen, it's all that stuff. It's got uh, I, ex I expect you to die and all that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's got quotes, it's got some good action, it's got it's got the real bad, you know, Sean Connery rear projection car thing. But it's uh, it's just it's I think it's got this is probably the one which set up many of the elements that would follow on in in subsequent Bond films with the gadgets and and the various set pieces and the and the I know they did feature in some of the other earlier films where you'd have like the the women with the double entendre names and the henchmen things like that. But it's uh, it was a good it's a good uh, it's a good story as well with the whole plot by or a Goldfinger. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's easy ways to do it. Uh, it's, it's also got the iconic scene of uh, <clears throat> her name Shirley Eaton, who's uh, covered in in, in gold, mm -hmm. that way and things like that. Lots of good, cool bits. Bond doing some undercover the, on the work and 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 just yeah, some great interactions. I love the way he discovers things by you know he gets taken prisoner, but then he breaks out, figures things out by wandering around or sneaking around the the HQ, and it's just and a, a good fight with odd job and stuff like that. Yeah, but, uh, that's my number two, Goldfinger. I I really like Goldfinger a lot, and I when I was trying to figure out which Sean Connery movie, it was down to pretty much Goldfinger and um, Doctor No, and maybe one or two, one 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 other one. But um, it didn't make my list because I watched it not that long ago, and I love the first like three fourths of the movie, and I find the climax, the whole attack on Fort Knox uh, stuff, a, a little bit of a letdown. I find it a little bit weak. Um, it's so that kind of knocked it down a peg for me. I do really like the movie, but I don't think the climax is as good as it could have been. Yeah. Um, so I love everything you said about it, and then the ending kind of is like, eh, all right, it's not so, it's not so great. So that's why I didn't make my list, but it is it is certainly a favorite for sure. Cool. All right, that brings us to my number one, which I know is not your number one. We've discussed this film before, and you do not like it as much as I do, and you're wrong. Um, and I have told you so, and I have told you you need to revisit it um, because I think you need to. I think you need to revisit it. I think it'll change your opinion um, because I watched it again not that long ago, and it's absolutely amazing. And it is number my number one is Skyfall. Uh, Daniel Craig again. Um, it is to me the perfect james bond movie it's got all the characters that you love it's got a great villain who does things a little bit differently it has really great action set pieces the story is wide ranging it travels all over the world all these different locations um it's got the cool ending which is you know bond kind of stripped down to the essentials you know under siege um it's got a big budget and everything looks great um you know craig is super intense there's a lot of neat nods to the history of james bond you know they did away with a lot of the in the later in the, the, the craig movies did away with some of the gadgets and all that stuff but there's some really nice um you know paying tribute to the past in skyfall um there's the car it's just i I love it. I think it's fantastic. And I'm telling you, Phil, I know how you feel about it, but you need to go back. You haven't watched it in a while. Go back and rewatch it. I, I can almost guarantee it's going to change your opinion about it. I When I rewatched it a few months ago, I was surprised because I loved it the first time I saw it. And I rewatched it. I was surprised how much I loved it more watching it again. So I'm just telling you, it needs a rewatch. Okay. Well, I just it does it does look great. It always, always uh, the scenery and the shots and everything was really good. But yeah, I just no. I'll have to give it another watch. But it's just Home Alone at the end. It's and there's, so, there's so many bits where you go, no, why did you? You could have. It's you not. Know, no, I see. I disagree. I think if you watch it again, the ways, but it's a whole other thing. I think if you watch it again, you will see that there's a lot more logic. Because I understand where that where you're coming from. Where you're, you know, I hate when movies are like, well, why don't you just do this? But I think if you watch it again, there's a lot more internal logic at play where the things that happen make sense more than you think they do. Yeah, just yeah. I should. I need to watch it again. It's been a while. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But yeah. Okay, that's your number one. Yep. My number one has been on your list, and it is Casino Royale. The Daniel Craig's first Bond, because I just I like the way it stripped it all down. We saw Bond from the beginning, uh, again as double O. I mm -hmm. love the, the you know the fact it was in black and white as well. Uh, I liked it as you saw him as it, he was he wasn't the the suave gentleman spy at the time. He was basically a tank just running through walls and stuff, chasing the guy. Mm -hmm. Just not really knowing. I love the fact Vespers, the one who shows him how to where a tuxedo. I loved. I loved the way we just kept seeing how Bond became Bond. He mm -hmm. went from being the soldier to being the spy. 
which I thought was great. Yep. Uh, it was a good story as well. Mads Mickelson was really cool. It's probably a little bit too long because the bit when you get to Venice, suddenly you feel like, oh, yeah, it's over. And then it's sort of, oh, oh, oh. a bit like the Dark Knight sort of that bit at the end. But, uh, yeah, I really liked that. And Daniel Craig, I thought, was excellent in it. It just felt more like uh, – it felt more real. It was more mm. grounded, I suppose, which was – don't always want in a James Bond film, but the fact they were beginning again was a, was a nice thing to do. Uh, I still find it mad with the subsequent films or how he was Casino Royale, he was the new spy, and then it seemed to be every other one he was too old for, he was retiring and had to get pulled back right. in. I never quite understood that. But uh yeah, I really liked it. It's and then, called a time jump, Phil. You see, there was yeah. like several other James Bond adventures that happened between the two movies. Yeah, but it's just it's these are the same thing. He's retired and let's get him back in for the last the last two or three. But Gold Casino Royale was my favorite Daniel Craig one, and then it was No Time to Die was my second one, and then the others. Hmm. Quantum of Solace at the bottom. Quantum of Solace is easily the worst of them all. I actually like Spectre way more than a lot of people. I don't understand the the, the dislike of Spectre. I think Spectre is a really good James Bond film. I, I enjoy it um, quite a bit personally. But Quantum of oh, Solace, I, I rewatched it not that long ago, and again, I still just yeah. it's, I have a hard time with that one. It's got a few. I like the way stuff. I like the way it follows straight on from Casino Royale. I like yes, that. yes, agreed. Agreed. I do like that about the Craig films. Um, and it does have that cool crane sequence and stuff, but it's definitely the worst of them. The main problem I have with the Daniel Craig films, though, is the fact they started tying everything into Bond. The reason why this happened was because of Bond. Instead of him being the guy who gets sent in to sort this out, because the guy's just a maniac and does this a little bit too much. I always find if you do that too much, it just makes everything smaller instead of it making it bigger, because mm -hmm. it's all because of this one guy. That's my main problem with it, but Casino Royale was my favorite Bond. There you go. Yeah, I almost put Casino Royale and Skyfall as my one and two, but I wanted to kind of spread the love around a little bit more. Um, and I do love like other ones, like I said, like Goldeneye and so mm -hmm. like Spy Who Loved Me. Maybe isn't a better film than Casino Royale, but it's got a little more. It's got nostalgia to it, so that kind of adds. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think that's a lot of the thing with the Bond films: the nostalgia, where you were when you first saw them, and yep. stuff like that. All right, so we got a couple of top fives from some of our listeners or slash read. Uh, slash viewers let's share those now so yeah. james james comes in two parts so i'll get to that so his top five i'll go backwards uh number five is from russia with love i don't i don't love that one personally james that's i know that's one of sean connery's that's one of the reasons why i complain about the sean connery films is i find that one a little a little dull number four man with the golden gun almost made my list i do like that one a lot a great bad guy christopher Lee yes. Was great yes uh number three license to kill really like that one a lot i think timothy dalton gets a bad rap but didn't quite make my list. Number he two, should have Casino had more. Royale. He, sh he should have had more. Dalton. Yeah. yeah, agreed. Uh, number two, Casino Royale. I think we all agree on that one. And number one, Goldfinger, also mm -hmm. on Phil's list. So nice. But then James says uh, a little later down, because um, after I talked about how great Skyfall is, so clearly I'm a good persuader, he says, I do love Skyfall. Actually, I replaced my Russia with love with that one. So now Skyfall comes in as James' is number five. So good on you there, James. Uh, James, James, you're dead to me now. <laughs> then uh richard has uh joined as well with his top five number five man with the golden gun that was also yeah, on james's yeah. list number four from russia with love interesting that so many people like yeah, from yeah. russia with love maybe i have to revisit it it's um i just i remember watching it and feeling like that was one of my lesser favorite james bond movies i don't know something it just didn't, just didn't it didn't feel very james bondy to me either i feel like it, part of the problem with it for me is it feels like the least james bondish film I Although it's again. still better than You Only Live Twice, which sees Sean Connery. Oh, first that's not that's not proper Bond. Made that's... up as a Japanese guy, which is bad, but just also isn't a good movie. Yeah. Um, Actually, number three, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not good. Number three, yeah. Goldeneye, huge fun, kind of panto, but Brosnan kicks ass. I don't know what that means. Actually, uh, there's over here in the UK, we have pantomimes, which are a big camp at Christmas. We have like all these kind of. It takes too long to explain, but I, okay. I know what you mean. A camp, I, I yeah. get it. That makes sense. All right, I disagree. I think it's not panto but i like it um skyfall agreed at number two technically best roger deacon's oh, it's technically best like like the most technically mm -hmm. advanced film because roger deacon's cinematography is awesome i agree wholeheartedly i That's agree on that as well, film. Things, yeah. and then number one casino royale love it despite the last half hour of venice destruction same thing that you said oh film. yeah 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 um so i yeah yeah well well said richard um <laughs> and then he comments on your thing about Bond by saying like how all terrorists in the world are related to Jack yeah, Bauer. It just makes 24. it ridiculous because it can't all be related to the one person. I don't. It's funny. I you know I just I've rewatched them recently too, and I don't remember it. I don't remember it feeling like everything was because of James Bond. I remember that he's sort of tied into it, but I don't. No, it's when you get to Spectre though, and you got Blofeld saying it's all because of you, James. It's basically you go and this guy set up a whole criminal organization because. His dad, yeah, like, the kid that but he's I feel like that's... Go, no, why? 
I feel like that's more like he did all this stuff anyway. And then when he had James Bond there, it was kind of like, ah, I'm going to mess with this guy and be like, it's all because of you. I don't know. I guess I see, I, I guess I see what you're saying. I, I'd have to rewatch it and pay more attention to that. I, that wasn't, I guess the impression that I got from it, but I'm a little thick sometimes. So who knows? Um, <laughs> you know, we can so, all be a little thick sometimes, Mike. That is true. That is true. Um, all right, cool. So, uh, good. So some good lists there. I mean, I, as we say, you know, this is, like I said, I could redo this list tomorrow. It would be different. Or if I rewatched every film in order and had them all fresh in my mind, I might change my list as well. Um, yeah. but I do, I love all the James Bond films and, um, they're all really, I even considered putting no time to die on there. Uh, but it was still too new. I felt like I needed a little yeah, more time yeah. with it, but, yeah. um, yeah, love me some James Bond for sure. All right, cool. Great comments. Thank you for everybody watching and, and um, pitching in as well. We really love to hear uh, your thoughts and your lists also. Oh, we had some worst James Bond lists. We want to share those, Phil? Yeah, go on. We can do that. All right. I don't get too far into the worst list, but let's throw those up real quick. Um, Richard says, the five worst. Moonraker, Die Another Day, Quantum of Solace, Spectre, and Octopussy. Uh, I'll give you Moonraker, Quantum of Solace, and Octopussy. I really like Spectre personally, even though it gets a bad rap. And I actually like Die. I know Die Another Day gets torn to pieces because of the invisible car. I get that. But aside from that, I actually really like that movie. It's kind of Brosnan's like revenge film, sort of like License to Kill, um, because it's the whole thing of him being held in the prison and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, I like um, the, opening, the opening. And the opening. I like that movie. The invisible car stuff is silly. I agree. But I do enjoy the film personally. And then we had, I thought we had another one with the worst. No, I think that was it. Is that it? Okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, there we go then. Um, okay. So then that brings us to ATE recommends. Phil, yes. I'm going to let you go first on this. Okay. One. I've got two things here. Okay. One is a game and one is a TV show. Right. This one is it's uh I've not actually played this yet, but I played earlier versions. It was a Kickstarter and it's it's finally come in. It is Twilight 2000 role playing in the World War Three that never was. Mm -hmm. And it's basically exactly what it is. It's set in like uh, Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, but it's been there's been a nuclear incidents, everything's gone to parts, but you're playing a group, a band of soldiers. It's more like a sandbox kind of role playing game where it's the, the games master will set up you, you know, you've got to take this particular point or you've got to get to there, you've got to survive. Basically, you just got to survive in a terrible situation, but it's just, it had some really in-depth role playing when I played it in the past. And this new system by Free League is just, uh, looks really, really good. It's Can you just, hold it up again? Okay, good, because I, I just put you on solo. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's, there we it's go. That's the front cover. It's got yeah, some beautiful artwork it in it as well. Cool. I did see your posts on social about playing that, so I'm excited that. Uh... Yeah, I'm looking forward to playing this. But you get you've got loads of maps, uh, all various cards, uh, just real, real well put together. Free League always do some good stuff. They've also they did the behind me the aliens role playing game. I've got the starter set, which is great, and some other stuff. So I can recommend all their things. But it's just came out. I got it delivered. I backed it a while ago. I'm looking forward to playing it. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's my first one, and the second one is one which I. I've had for a while. Uh, it's a DVD of a TV show called The Middleman, based on a, a great comic book okay. series. Uh, it's just, oh, it's ridiculous. It's the <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's written by Javier Grillo Marsh. Ah, so, I know how to pronounce his name. I found out how to pronounce well, his name because I always wonder about it. It's Javier Grillo Marks Watch. See, okay. Later. I only know that because I was on a pod. I was listening to a podcast with him, and he pronounced it. And I was like, because I'd seen his name in the credits for, I think, Lost or some other show for a long That's time. Right, yeah, I, was, yeah. I always was like, how the heck do you pronounce that? And then he said it out loud, and I was like, yes. So it's Javier Grio Mark's watch. Okay, well, that's good. I know that. Now. <laughs> I'm but super yeah, excited yeah. that I got to I got to use that piece of trivia because nobody cool. else in my world cares about how you pronounce that, but I know yeah. you do. And so I just yeah. totally geeked out on that. Excellent. Well, I'm glad that I'm glad that's. Yeah, we've got that sorted. But it's also got yeah. art by Les McLean, but the TV show is based on that. And it's uh, basically the middleman is a guy who works for an organization. He's not the head of it. He's just the middleman. But he brings uh, right. on a new uh, protege called Wendy Watson. And they have to defend the Earth against, as you say here, exotic problems such as animated terracotta warriors, menacing lucha libra wrestlers, extraterrestrials, trout-eating zombies, and so much more. It's just stupid fun. It's full of pop culture references, cool quotes, it's very low budgets, and that does show in places. But it's if you just like quirky, corny, action-packed on a low budget, it's uh, it's fun, and the cast is good. 
uh, good stories, and it just it just makes me laugh. But it, that's when, did it, when did it come out? Like, I mean, when did the show air? Oh, way back when. I can quickly find out. The Middleman. I, I feel like I. Part of me feels like I vaguely remember it, and part of me is like, no, you're totally making that up. I don't remember this at all, and I'm trying to decide if I do remember it at all or not. But I it don't was, think I do. It was way back. They didn't. I don't think they aired all the episodes as well. It was back in 2008. There was only one season. Mm -hmm. Uh, was it a British show episodes. or an American show? American, American. Only 12 episodes were made, uh, but the 13th episode they did a live tour uh, read through. Right. But it starts Matt Kiesler and Natalie Morales and a few other people. But lots of people, when you're watching it, sporting cast, you will recognize some other stuff. But it's right, right, fun. right. And you can probably pick it up cheap on eBay or other places like that. Cool. And that's right, my recommendation. Right. Out. I definitely, if I do remember it even vaguely, I definitely don't remember it enough to like think i watched any of it so. I, I think you'll dig it i think you'll like it cool yeah all right well my ate recommends my recommendation this week um is uh, so okay i'll give the background a little bit of background but i i had it's a tv show also i had zero interest in watching it even though i'm okay. a big fan of the okay. subject matter um but i didn't i didn't want to watch it and it is now i don't have the, the my blu-ray set is downstairs i forgot to bring it upstairs but i have the picture i brought up it is Superman uh, and Lois. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. So, it, this Tyler Hoechlin plays Superman. Uh, Elizabeth something plays Lois. I forget who she is. So, there we go. Superman and Lois. Um, I didn't, I didn't love, this is going to sound very um, shallow. I didn't love the way Tyler Hoechlin looked as Superman in the in the promos for it, or when he appeared on Supergirl, um, which I didn't watch those episodes. I, only, I think maybe I saw one, but I only saw the commercials for them. But I, um, I didn't the trailers for Superman and Lois did literally nothing for me. I don't know. I just, the few commercials I saw made it look like they didn't show you much of what it was about. It looked kind of stupid. It looked kind of cheesy. looked a little bit boring. It just didn't look all that interesting. Even though I'm a big Superman fan, I didn't bother watching it. Um, fast forward to, you know, a week or two ago, uh, um, a couple weeks ago, and I got the Blu-ray collection of season one to review. So of course I had to sit down and, and, and watch it. I haven't watched all of them yet. Um, but I really, really like it. It is a really cool, it's kind of like the after Smallville or like if Smallville is like the prequel to Superman's Metropolis adventures, Superman and Lois is like the sequel almost because what happens is uh, Superman and Lois have twin sons, they're teenage sons. And so they decide to move back to Smallville to sort of focus more on family because Clark is always away saving the world. And, he, you know, <laughs> and um, the twin sons are very polar opposites. One is like your dark, broody, moody, kind of getting into trouble, maybe bipolar type. The other one is like your all-American, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed quarterback. Um, and so it's a, it's, it kind of does the Smallville thing in a way where it's like, you know, you do get some Superman action. I mean, it does show up in costume, not like Smallville, but it's not about him fighting bad guys every week. It's about the family and him trying to be a good father and raise these kids who may or may not have powers. Um, and uh, it's not something they rush into. And I, I really like the relationship between Clark and Lois. I feel like that's the hallmark of any good Superman show but i also really like the twin sons and i think that's part of what i what drew, drew me to the show is it would be very easy for them to be annoying um and they're not and i think their relationship is so realistic it's like one minute they're saying hardly mean things to the to each other and the next minute they're like hugging and like oh my god that's so awesome i'm happy for you like i, I feel like they have a really good brother relationship and, and clark has a really good father son relationship and what i like too it's the anti Zack snyder you know, um, <laughs> Snyder Superman films are so dark and he never yeah, smiles, yeah. this and that. The very first, like the first five minutes of Superman and Lois, he saves a kid from like a falling car and he kind of lands in front of him. And the kid is like, wow, great costume. And, and Superman says, thanks, my mom made it and flew off. And I was like, <laughs> yes, like that's what Superman should be like. He's a little bit dorky a little bit cheesy he's a, he's a he's the big blue boy scout not cheesy even but just like he's good natured you know he's he shouldn't be like i'm superman and i'm very serious about everything you know you should have fun with it and be super yeah. you know and so i really like that uh, a lot and so i've been really enjoying it um and i'm sorry i didn't watch it originally but i'm really psyched to get into it now and i hope it lasts a long time because i am a big superman fan um i've really re-embraced my superman fandom in recent years you know batman's great everyone loves him but i sometimes get tired of all the dark stuff I've, i'm i'm very lawful good i've realized and i am drawn to <laughs> lawfully good characters so like superman is a favorite captain america is a favorite like i i leonardo the leader of the ninja turtles he's my favorite ninja turtle right i like the lawful good characters and so 
I've really dove into my Superman fandom recently, and uh, so I'm totally enjoying Superman and Lois. And clearly, so is our viewer, Wayne, who says, love that series, family first, then being super. That's a perfect way to put it, Wayne. I agree wholeheartedly. That's what it's about. So you get the family drama, but you get enough superpowered stuff that it doesn't feel like, well, come on, get to the get to the exciting stuff. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. Really good supporting characters, too. Good supporting cast. Um, really, really impressed with it. It took me by surprise. I'm not going to lie. So that's my recommendation, Superman and Lois. Uh, the first season is out uh, on home video, and I'm sure it's on, uh, I think, believe it's streaming on, maybe on HBO Max, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, it's on HBO Max, actually, for sure. Um, so definitely worth watching if you haven't yet. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I've not seen that yet, because I got a bit burnt out with the CW DC superhero sure. shows. It definitely feels a little different from all their other yeah. DC shows, I think. It's a, it's a much different tone. Um, than a lot of the like Arrow and DC, you know, Legend, uh, what's it called? The Legends of DC. Legend of Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Legend of Tomorrow, all those things. I definitely feel like it's a, it's a much more, it's much more along the sort of, I, I hate to keep making the comparison because it's not the same show, but it's much more along like the Smallville vein than the whole DC verse on the CW. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, because it's I've heard other people saying it's it's really good. So I'll have to check that out. And it's yeah, also, yeah. I saw Lois Lane is played by Elizabeth Tullock. That's the name. Thank you. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah. It took me a minute to get used to her because she's she's not who I necessarily picture in my head as Lois. But then yeah. by the end, of, like the first episode, you're like, oh, she's perfect. She's Lois. She she <laughs> nailed it. You know what I mean? So uh, yeah, and and Tyler Hoechlin too. Like I said, is, 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 at first it was kind of like, hmm, he's you know I don't know if I love. It doesn't fit my image in my head necessarily. But then after you, you see him in an episode or two, you're like, oh, he's perfect. He he nailed it. Like he got it. So uh, yeah, really enjoying that. Cool. And, yeah, and not out. a recommendation, but one last minute plug for anybody who stuck with us this long. Um, you know, don't forget uh, my Kickstarter is live now. If you enjoyed the last hour or so and you want to support uh, comics, if you're in the UK, you can do them digitally because shipping is super expensive, although you could order them physically as well. Um, but if you're in the US, uh, go to Kickstarter, pledge on Red, White and Broke. Um, we're we're two thirds of the way to our funding goal, but we still need some more help. Um yeah. And uh, I think if you like what we do here, you will enjoy my comics. So yeah, I've backed it. I've little... I've read the first two issues, and even though I'm friends with Mike, I really enjoyed it. I'm not just saying that because we're friends. It's a good story. It's got some great artwork, some great uh, alternate covers as well, which riff on some classic comic book covers. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, Jim Shooter really likes it as well. That's right. I got a nice uh, testimonial from Jim Shooter, who's a comic book legend. Uh, so that was really cool. And I got to hang out with him a little bit this weekend. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So just, you know, like I said, check it out. Take a look. And if you're so inclined to pledge, uh, I would be greatly appreciative of it. Okay. So there we go, Phil. We supersized our ep We successfully supersized our episode. I like the alliteration there. Um, I, I think it worked well. We got some great comments from our viewers. Thank you guys so much for chiming in. We really appreciate you guys. Love the energy that it brings to the show to have live comments from people. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. I'm glad uh, James drove safely. Yes. Yep. Sounds like he got where he was going, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I think that's going to start wrapping us up, right, Phil? Anything else we need to say? I think we've done everything. We've covered some big things and we brought it down to back down to earth. There you go. I like it. All right. Well, on that note, then we will wrap up this episode, but we will be back in two weeks with a brand new episode with a, a new after the ending, a new top five, some other stuff we'll talk about. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys then. So as always, uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for participating. Um, I'm Mike Spring. And I'm Phil Edwards. And we'll see you next time. After the ending.